it. So the importance in Latin America, I'm gonna put some more emphasis in Latin America where Katy has been working more. Um, livestock has an important role in, in, in terms of the meat proteins they're producing, the income of close to 127 billions of dollars in the economy and also relatively high consumption of animal proteins. So I think when you look at consumption patterns, on one hand, in, in countries like Africa, still people are not reaching the daily minimum of consumption of meat that they need. But on the other hand, there's an overconsumption of meat and milk in other countries, which is triggering this debate. On the other hand, the issue of the planetary boundaries and looking at the safe operating space, you can see already, uh, large biodiversity loss in terms of um, impacts on deforestation, for example, in the case of the livestock, the role of agriculture putting a lot of pressure on the planet and, 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 and the ecosystem services, but also on health issues. So we are also moving beyond the operating space. Nitrogen cycles in, in the crop spaces have also been increasing uh, in these conditions. This is the report that the Eat Lancet uh, have published, uh, which is triggering the debates of overconsumption of meat and, and its relation between human health and planet health in, in terms of emission, trying to look at what will be a reference diet for people. And in this reference diet, uh, promoting more the consumption of beans, uh, more healthy diets and plant-based proteins, etc., cetera, uh, as one way of addressing health issues, but at the same time, looking at the planet health. And I would demonstrate to you that livestock systems can play an important role of balancing these objectives in terms of looking at plant-based protein and animal-based proteins and reducing the impacts on the climate in terms of emissions, et cetera. Cathy has been working with the World Bank and looking at uh, the supply chains that are putting pressure on, on on, on the forest reserves. Uh, beef in many of the countries like Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, and the Amazon region, Honduras, for example, are continuing to put a lot of pressure uh, for expansion. Uh, many people are cutting down the forest, um, increasing the area for pastures in some cases, but also there are all the pressures from all the supply chains, which this port has uh, uh, set up like a case of mean coffee. Uh, these are some examples which my colleague is going to talk more later. Garcia, can you advance? I, I have a problem here. Okay, I will share the presentation again. Seems to having some problem. Okay. Can you get back to the other slide, please? Yeah. Just. Um, you let me know. Okay. okay yeah. Next, Next please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next, 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 next. Okay, on the other hand, we, we have an issue of the emissions. Can you get back to the slide before? We have an issue of the emissions of the greenhouse gases um, where that's an important aspect. Livestock is contributing towards close to 10 to 15% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see in Latin America, many of these countries are playing an important role, especially because of land use changes, but also because of the diet in terms of enter enteric fermentation. And that's an area where Cathy has put it more in depth research to look at how to reduce the impacts of the emissions, but at the same time promoting the carbon sequestration because of the tropical conditions, they increase the growth in uh, CO2 capture from, from the systems. Next. Uh, 
Uh, so the issue of looking at the livestock density and where you have intersection, you know, Latin America and especially in Central America, uh, it's a very vulnerable region to climate change. And so what you want to do is to look at the synergies between adaptation and mitigation to climate change. And here where Cathy has been working on silver pastoral systems as one of the entry points in together with all the good practices uh, three resources in the landscape where you can see in is be it in pastures or coffee or cocoa where my colleagues will uh, talk about is where Cathy has been working to understand on a landscape and agricultural landscapes how do they combine with the other forest matrix be it protected areas or forest reserves in providing the ecosystem services climate resilience on the landscape etc while at the same time addressing the issues of productivity gaps that we have in these agricultural systems. Next. So the COVID has been opened up a lot of discussion today in terms of the impacts of a fragmented landscape. You may, many of the, as I mentioned, many of the countries have been deforesting. Um, landscapes are fragmented. Many of the bats and primates make extensive use of the ripened forest and linear forest systems. Kati has got a good map of what are the linear features and what are the different tree resources in the landscape. And a higher probability that bats feeding on livestock and carry vir viruses. These are some of the risk factors now we're working on um, uh, to address these issues. Next. This is an example where the, these domestic animals are hosts of important viruses that we have. Um, you can see already some of these issues, the pandemics have been, we've been raising. And therefore, this is another area of research that is very important to look at the implications of ecosystem services uh, and tree resources in, in landscape, but also from a farming practices in terms of how do you promote good practices to reduce the risk uh, that you have from these pandemics. So I'm going to talk about efficiencies of the livestock systems as this globally, what Gleam has, has presented is the efficiency gaps. You can see only 10% of the farmers are producing more or less at the optimum or the what should be based on the context that we're working on. So it opens a big opportunity where you can target the 90% of these farmers to improve efficiencies of production reduce the intensity of emissions uh, from these livestock systems. And as an example of how to reduce the, the productivity gaps and efficiency gaps in the systems. Next. So CAT has been working on sustainable intensification approach in livestock systems. We work with many partners with the CGIR, with the private sector, with local organizations, the national farmers organizations trying to convert traditional systems, which is based on more grass monocultures to some extent with high intense emission intensities towards more sustainable intensification with an objective of having productivity, um, productivity per hectare, productivity per units of water use, productivity per unit of emission of greenhouse gases. And looking at the conservation goals in terms of conservation of biodiversity in, uh, in the systems that we work on. So this is the approach that we've been looking at in terms of productivity gains. Next. And to give you some idea of what we do in terms of silver pastoral systems, we work with SEAT, for example, to look at improved forages that have been developed. Um, and these, next please, integrated in different practices of silver pastoral systems, be it trees in, in the pastures. Uh, in the case of Cuba, they've been advancing on these silver pastoral systems to give an idea of what, we, what are the different practices and the features of these practices. Next. Uh, Central America, you're gonna find that the, the whole systems on the landscape with simple life fences where, where farmers are cutting these, these trees. But you also have multi-layer life fences or multi-strata life fences where they play a more important role in the conservation of the biodiversity, but also play additional role in terms of producing timber and other services in the systems, including shade for, for animals. Next. 
And also CATI has been advancing in not only looking at grass as a source of feed, but also integration of high value for the trees with high nutritive value for intensive, sustainable intensification uh, and the feeding to increase the productivity and also reducing the emissions. An example where we work on the use of water banks for feeding the animals. Next. And many of the dry areas, you're going to find what they call the, the secondary the re regeneration of, of trees, um, where cattle graze under these, these systems. They play an important role, not only in feeding, but also in terms of conservation of biodiversity. Also providing services uh, to the farmers so in terms of firewood, etc. Uh, this is also one of the practices that have been um, evaluated in the systems. Next. So CATI has worked in advance in, and has a large database on the, on the status of biodiversity in a landscape. I'm going to talk more on the dominance of, of cattle in, in the landscape, where all these practices which I've shown are playing, playing an important role in the connectivity, in the structural and functional con connectivity in the landscape, and linking in a mosaic of a policy scape where you link with the protected areas for you know, conserving the biodiversity uh, in these areas. We see good uh, systems where agroforestry and civil pastoral systems are enhancing the conservation of biodiversity and species of interest for conservation. Next. Uh, this is a work that they've looked at the, the, the matrix or the land, land use matrix or mosaic of the different systems, be it from more forests systems, which goes from primary forests to secondary or riparian forests, and towards more these civil pastoral systems, which I've shown, which demonstrates that the, if you look at the different taxes, if it birds or butterfly, mollusks, ants, or trees, how, how these uh, species are using the landscapes and what will be needed to design the, the planning of the landscape, the farm, farm planning and the farm mosaic, mosaic mosaics. Uh, so we have advanced methods for methodologies for measuring the biodiversity, understanding what incentives will be required to promote the, the, the re-engineering of these landscapes to promote the conservation of biodiversity and understanding that biodiversity is a tool for reaching ecosystem services, providing the services, for example, pollination, which is an area where some of my colleagues have been, have been measuring. And these are some of the work that we're looking at in terms of biodiversity conservation and the landscape, but also looking at the, the, the systems and services they present. Next. So how do the biodiversity on the landscape or the tree resources in the landscape is contributing towards adaptation to climate change? For example, the temperatures are increasing. We have seen data already coming out from Glasgow, the, the IPCC, which shows that we have, they are passing the 1.52 degrees uh, increase in temperature. Uh, the, 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 in other words, the, the temperature is becoming hotter. Uh, shade trees play an important role in reducing the heat stress. Uh, also play an important role, the trees in providing improved diet and quality of forages to reduce the scarcity of forages in, in the dry season. And this is some example where Cathy has been quantifying the impact of these tree resources. Next. This is an example based on the traits of the trees and which has been measured um, where differences are up to eight degrees lower temperature on the shade canopy, depending on the, the, the densities of the canopy and, and, the, and the, the architecture of, of these plants. But the importance is that farmers now have been adopting these shade trees as a way of mitigating the heat stress and increases of one, one way and uh, designing the systems with different species that they're working on where we have measured in pastures. Next. Example where shade trees increase milk productivity. We have worked with looking at dairy cows. Um, milk production has increased 11 to 15 percent. If cattle was having access to shade trees as one way, we know there are other interactions in the systems. The respiratory rate, which is one of the indicators of how to mitigate the heat stress on animals, you can see 
how shade trees are reducing the respiratory rate per minute of these cows. Next. But also we are looking at the genetic improvement. Tropical breeds adapted to the conditions, uh, looking at how they adapt to more higher temperatures, but also maintaining the productivity. And Cathy has been advancing to look at breeds that are adapted locally under the conditions that we have, and looking at emission intensities, but also looking at productivity gains. Next. Now we are, we are publishing improved data on the, what the crosses that we've, we've used in terms of breeds like Jir or Saiwal, Senepol. These are some of the breeds that we're working on, adapted to the climate conditions, producing up to 5,000 liters of milk per lactation, which is relatively high, uh, based on improved forages and intensive feeding systems. But also of importance to look at the redu reduction in emission intensities. We have reduced the emission intensities of methane, but also of nitrous oxide to the better management of, of manure in these pastures. And this is one of the topics that has been debated glo globally on how to reduce the emissions from, from the cattle systems as one way of providing solutions to the NDCs required. Next. Also, our objective is to show how cattle systems play an important role in diversification. Timber is an important role uh, in the life fences, but also in some of the systems that we worked in, in tree dispersing pastures. We've been measuring timber production in small, medium, and large farms um, as a way of reducing the pressure on deforestation for, for timber or for wood. Uh, and this is an example where many farmers now are integrating in the landscape of timber species in, in the systems. Next. Also, we are looking at the different practices in terms of intensification. And based on these different practices in this slide, you can see the difference between the systems on the different agroecological conditions you're working on, be it in a lowland extensive dual purpose uh, systems for meat and milk, or extensive specialized dairy in the lowlands or the lowland intensified specialized dairy trying to construct the gradient of the different production systems as we want to provide solutions that are scalable. And here you can see, based on the, the colors of this graph, where enteric fermentation, which is very critical for looking at emissions, is different between the different systems, higher on the low, lowland and extend, in extensive dual purpose cattle systems. Therefore, our entry point is to see how can you reduce this emissions by improving the feed and looking at productivity, but also looking at the reproductive uh, uh, practices and gains efficiencies that we're gonna have. Next. So we have been looking at practices that contribute, looking at the synergies between production to reduce the productivity gaps. And here you can show some examples where improved pastures and management, you can have, up to 50% reduction of the emission intensity, gains in the production up to 600%. If you look at the baseline information that we, we're comparing, strategic supplementation in the dry season, you know, Central America, the dry forest corridor is rather dry, 48%, a 300% increase in the baseline in production. And with cross spreads, we also have got advantages in terms of redu reduction of emissions versus the, the production. So this is the practices that we've been moving towards looking at the win-win situation for emissions and productivity. Next. Also, Cathy has been working to looking at carbon sequestration and as documented, has several publications on, on carbon sequestration in pastures. You know, tropical systems offer an important role uh, in mitigating the emissions by increasing carbon capture in the systems. And we have data up to two to three tons of carbon captured in many of the systems uh, per year, which is good for increasing uh, re the carbon and reducing emissions. Next. Recently, Cathy started to work based to address the issues globally, looking at the circularity of the agro-silver pastoral systems. I still think that if the demand for beans and all these meat, uh, different vegetables to maintain a balanced diet, as the Eat Lancet report, presented, 
A um, large percentage of these vegetables will come from livestock farms, which plays an important role in the circularity in terms of manure re recycling and nutrients, nitrogen uh, through ma manure, phosphorus, etc. But at the same time, the integration of crop residues towards improving feeding of the animals. And here is where we show the circularity of how to transform or transition the livestock farms into more mixed systems where tree resources are gonna play an important role in terms of providing ecosystem services, diversification, but also looking at the productivity gains that we have. So this is an example of the gender in, in, in incorporating women also, uh, gender and inclusion, youths, as a way of a new model of the systems that we want to, to test and, and, and move forward. Next. So I'm going to spend a few minutes to talk about the experiences with payment for ecosystem services and the incentive schemes that we've been working on as one way to promote the scaling up of these systems. They do show impacts on the biological responses, the income, the economics, but we want to see more scaling up in, in, in the region. Next. We tested payment for ecosystem services, develop, developing an index which integrates the, the carbon uh, potential for, for sequestration, but also biodiversity. This project was done uh, 2002, but the importance to show how the impacts of ex post analysis demonstrate that if farmers were having incentives, um, they will adopt technologies which will promote the permanence and sustainability in the long term. Next. So this slide shows that if you have control farms without payment of ecosystem services or those farms with payment for ecosystem services, which is in green, uh, they do promote improvements in terms of adoption of silvopastoral systems, like for example, pastures with high tree densities, pastures with low tree densities, forest-based plantations. Um, so we, we concluded that payment was an incentive to promote the scaling up of these technologies. Next. Next, please. Here, after the project ended in 2007, we are continuing to monitor the farmers to see how permanent are these system, how permanent are these system. And after 2014, today we are doing another survey on the farms to show that Farmers are maintaining the, the, the structures of changes they've made in terms of the civil pastoral systems they've adopted. We see that the control farms are also increasing the, 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 the area and silver pastoral systems. And that's very important because we think the technical assistance that we offer to farmers also play an important role in changing the behavioral pat way patterns how they manage these civil pastoral systems. Next. Now, Kati is working, and Gracia Lanza, who is moderating, is part of this group that is working uh, on the NAMA uh, proposal uh, submitted to NAMA facility of transforming the Honduran livestock sector to contribute to a low carbon economy. Uh, it includes agenda sensitive climate finance to ease the adoption of silver pastoral technologies. Next. This project is working it, uh, on a three-pronged approach to transforming Honduran livestock, looking at farm education and extension services, looking at financial instruments and innovative uh, financial schemes, and what are the political framework that we need to transform the sector. Next. So after the ex ante analysis, with more than 211 farms, and looking at the barrier analysis that was conducted to look at behavioral changes and transformation. The colleagues who are quoted the present this presentation showed that farmers can work on natural pastures with trees and farms, 60% in the farm, improved pastures with trees and farms, say 39%, live fences, 29%. And these are the land use matrix in the farms that would contribute towards improving their productivity and reducing the emissions to have a carbon neutral farms, carbon neutrality. 
Now we are advancing in the analysis on a bigger scale of farms and looking at the different uh, agroecological systems and silvopastoral systems that we work on as a way. And we hope to implement this project by the next January as one of the two projects that are working on uh, with current NAMA facility and advancing on NAMA uh, in the region. Costa Rica is one of the countries that is working in the NAMA livestock also. Uh, so you can see that countries are advancing using silver pastoral system systems with NAMA. Next. So I will finish this presentation to say that if you look at Costa Rica over time and in, in, in the time period, it was one of the most deforested country which a large percent of the deforestation occurred for expansion of cattle and agriculture. It, the forest cover shrunk to 26%, as you can see in the graph below. The pasture area was increased 2.4 million hectares in 1980, and you can see productivity was relatively low. However, if over time, if you look at the timeline, the milk yields have been increasing. Costa Rica is one of the countries with the high, one of the highest productivity of milk in the tropics. Beef production is relatively stable because many people have been switching more towards milk production, more or less. The area of pastures have decreased from 2.4 to 1.3 million hectares. And the forest cover has increased 26% to 58%. Here I want to say that the forest cover is not only increased in the livestock farms, but a large percentage of the area which, which was on the pastures and degraded pastures were converted back into, into the forest systems. And these is, many of these forest matrix are on livestock farms and playing an important role of carbon sinks in biodiversity, ecosystem services, water. As an example, we are not at a national level the adoption of improved technologies, including improved uh, pasture technologies, forage technologies, and silver pastoral systems, in particular, live fences and trees, dispersed in pastures, played an important role in advancing, in increasing the, the tree cover, but also advancing in what, when, what Costa Rica is proposing to have a NAMA. Uh, livestock with an objective of reducing the emissions from the livestock sector. Next. So basically, for sustainable intensification and looking at the issues, the global issues, low carbon, produce more with less emissions is very important. Inclusive growth, there's a lot of emphasis on growth with, with, with women and, and youths. Create wealth, employment, and minimize negative social impacts on farmers. Looking at ecological sustainability, reduce the environmental impacts while safeguarding the natural resources, reducing the water footprint. And it should be appropriate nationally to considering the NDC goals, natural resources and objectives for sustainable development. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry for the problems we have with the technology. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibrahim. I, I was checking in the chat if there is any question. So, um, there are, yeah, there are a couple, one question, doctor, before. Um, thank you for the great presentation, says Margaret Carpe. And uh, she's asking some examples of the strategies for carbon capture under different agroecological settings, besides increasing tree density. And uh, how the calculation was done for how much capture uh, carbon was captured. Okay, well, you know, Kathy has been measuring carbon in, in the soil. Um, we published a book with the Wageningen University um, looking at the methods and isotopes for also looking at the carbon increases and also stable carbon stocks over time. Uh, Ed Welcome from the University of Gottingen started this work in 1993 and before we, we had work on that. And over time, we have measured the soil carbon and changes over time, I know there are new technologies now uh, looking at images, which is giving you better proxies for, for, for looking at that. So over time, um, we have measured the carbon in, in many of these areas, looking at different soil depths and different pasture systems, be it improved pastures or grass legume mixtures or uh, mixtures with, with trees, and quantifying the below ground uh, carbon in the soil, but also above ground 
carbon and putting more emphasis on the stable carbon stocks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Um, if there is, is there any other question? Um, we don't have any other question in the chat, so I think, um, yeah, if something comes up, please just write it down. We will follow up after the workshop uh, provided answers. Um, so now we will move on to the, our next presentation, um, which, uh, which is gonna be given by Dr. Um, Eduardo Somarriva. Uh, he's a senior researcher from the agroforestry um, unit, research unit at Katia, and he will be sharing with us uh, today shade motion, the analysis of three shade patterns in coffee and cocoa agroforestry systems. So Dr. Somarriva, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gracia. It's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. And we're gonna take a look at some research tool that we have been developing to aid in the optimal design of cocoa and coffee agroforestry systems. Trees are a very common feature in many agricultural landscapes. And they're especially the case in perennial crops like coffee and cocoa. Together, these two crops cover more than 22 million hectares in the world. And roughly 30% of that area is under shade. But there are very big differences between territories. No? There is 90% or around that amount of figure of use of shade in Latin America. But in Africa, which is the main producer, the use of shade is very minimal as it is in Asia. But this is changing. There is a, this strong movement now to reintroduce shade in the African system, which will affect some 5 million hectares of, of cacao cultivated in the world. So there is a, an important need, and there's a strong need for tools that help farmers and governments and NGOs and the academia to develop a sound system using shade as part of the production system in coffee and cocoa. However, most shade canopies that we see in Latin America and in general, most uh, farmers in many regions of the world have two optimal shade canopies. And the reason why this is so is not clear uh, so, so far. However, we can uh, safely say that Many farmers, most farmers, and also the extension agents lack the, the necessary knowledge. We, we run several studies in Bolivia, in Costa Rica, and Mexico, testing for this knowledge on how farmers and extension agents manage trees at the state canopy. And in most cases, the flunk in the examination. They manage information on some factors that are related to shade design, but in many of them, they don't know uh, how to really deal with, for example, the interaction between shade and fertility and yield, or the relation between the shading and water use and things like that. So there is a, a, a very important need for tools and information and knowledge and activities for education that provides this knowledge and put this in the hand of the farmers and the extension agents so that can really move to the optimal design of the cocoa and coffee agroforestry systems. So this is one of the reasons why we focus for a number of years now in the development of our, our software, a simple internet-based interactive software that can be used uh, with minimal input data because there are models out there in the literature to, to deal with the estimation, the quantification of shading in agri agricultural system. But most of these physiological models are very demanding in terms of input data and parameterization. And we wanted to move around this issue and develop a software that can be run using simple information that people know, farmers know, and most technicians in the field know, and that is also still very powerful 
and capable of modeling different typical management activities that you find in the farm, like change the planting density, change the species, pruning the grounds of the trees to regulate the shading, to plant or to harvest trees, all these uh, very practical and common activities in the farm. We wanted the software to be able to model this kind of activity. So we developed the Shade Motion. Shade Motion software it can be downloaded in, turn, in the internet, uh, www.shademotion.net. And it's, it's, uh, it has uh, tutorials in different languages and, and environments in different languages to so take a look at it. And the reason we need the software is also because there are no recipes in shade design. You need to test and try different alternatives for a specific areas. Every farm and even within a farm, one area of the cocoa plantation, the coffee plantation requires some decision regarding shading. And if you move to another area, you need to make a different decision. So there are no recipes. So what we needed is to develop methodologies. And we develop a methodology, which is for step methodology, where we systematically look at the different elements that need to be taken into consideration to make a proper decision about shading in a particular location in a farm. But uh, in addition to this methodology, you need the tools to assess uh, the decision that you make on the different step of the methodology. So we we'll start by looking at the, at the uh, the shade motion design and everything starts with the development of a conceptual unit which is the shade canopy and the shade canopy is considered as a volume you have a hectare say of land and then you can you also look at the height of the of the canopy of the trees and the vegetation there so you need a, you have a volume and the and the idea is to optimally use that volume in such a way that you fulfill all the, the objectives of the farm and that might be high production of the, the, of the crop, minimizing of the shading, negative shading, uh, the spatial distribution of the shading of the territory, uh, the production of different uh, tree products and also some eco ecological services like carbon sequestration or soil protection and so on and so forth. So we start by defining a, a unit of management, which is a shade canopy. And also you have to develop a conceptual model to explore all the interactions that take place within this shade canopy. In this simple model, you, for example, we see the people involved in making investment in expenses and also uh, obtaining resources from the sales for the products. But then the system is based on the use of trees and soils and the cocoa, uh, and the pests and diseases and the shading. And the idea is to model all these interactions, but once you want to model this interaction, you will need to clearly understand how the shading is occurring, is taking place in the plantation. And that's, that's why uh, what uh, Shea Motion is target to do, have this estimation to assess whether a particular Shea Canopy design is appropriate uh, for obtaining this goal in terms of shading. So I'll, I'll take a, a couple of minutes to explain a little bit about the fundamental of Shea Motion, and then I will give you an example that we run for a typical traditional system here in Costa Rica. This is basically, is modeling how the, the sun moves in the world. No? And this is uh, deterministic modeling because this uh, equation are apl applied to anywhere in the world. So you start by looking at the solar movement equations and you are gonna use the movement of the sun to project the shade on the ground, modeling the trees with different geometric forms. In this particular case, we use eight different geometries. Um, the equation, the mathematical equations that we develop are applicable to both horizontal and tilted planes, which is a, a very important uh, advancement. So we're published in the literature. Once you have this uh, 
terrain characteristic and the, the capacity to model, model the movement of the sun, you have to calculate a set of inequalities for the different ground shapes that is basically geomet analytic geometry, a little bit of calculus, so that you can express the shadow of any ground uh, type in tilted or horizontal planes in, in terms of inequalities that can tell you what particular coordinates in the terrain are under the shadow. Then we spend a lot of time in designing the computational algorithm because the number of computation, computations to, to model, let's say one hectare with 200 trees in the hectare uh, for 30 years, moving the sun every hour for 30, 65 days a year, there are trillions of calculations. So we wanted to develop a software that was very fast so that you can use this software in participatory work, let's say in a, in a, in a classroom or, or, or in a workshop with farmers in a farmer previous school program. So we, we had a, a group of programmers that did a wonderful job in making a very efficient and very fast software. And then a number of very important options as you can plant any number of trees in any special planting pattern. The populations can change. You can plant trees or you can harvest trees or they may die. Um, you can model entire cropping cycles. And then you need to know more about tree growth functions. Uh, we use different crown shapes. You can model crown density and any leaf, monthly leaf fall pattern. Uh, and there are many other input options like uh, sampling areas and possibility to, to control edge effects and so on and so forth. So it's a very complete software. It, it has already some 15,000, a bit more than that, uh, code lines. So it's, it's, it's already a complex software, but it's, it's very useful. And for example, we, I will show you a, a very simple example for Costa Rican agroforestry system with coffee. This is a two-story system that includes uh, Cordia leodora, which is a timbery species uh, in the upper strata. And then you have an intermediate strata with a Litrina poepigiana, which is a legume planted by a stake and is pollarded twice a year with a complete removal of the ground. So you can model the, the growth of the ground also. And this system is, is used by many smallholder farmers in the Turrialba area, which is where Katy is located. So we model this, this system, one hectare. You can see on the left, the, the blue dots are the, blue dots are the trees, the Aliodora, Cordia Aliodora, and the red dots are the Eritrina Popigiana. And then the central shaded area is, is a sampling area that we selected to avoid any edge effect. No? So all the computations can be done in the entire hectare and the system really can model very big farm up to 15, 14 hectares. But in this example, we model only one hectare. So all the data is taken only in the central shaded sampling area. And on the side, right side, you can see a 3D mockup of the system at three years of age, 12 years of age. And you can see the situation just before the pollarding of the Eritrina popigiana, and then after the pollarding of the Eritrina popigiana in the lower part of the picture. So, so the, the software is capable of keeping track of all these changes. For example, on your left, you see how tree cover changes over time, uh, year two, year four, year eight, year 12. And also within every year, you can see the contribution of tree cover for the different component of the system. In this case, the Cordia Aldora and the Eritrina. And you can see how the shade and the cover levels goes up and down depending on the management in this case, the pollarding of the Eritrina Pulpigiana. On the right side, you can see the evolution over the years in the upper blue graph, the evolution of the shade uh, levels uh, over the years. So this level, these shade levels reach about 1,300 hours per year of shade in, on average in every square meters of the territory after 10 years of age. 
but you can also look at the at the monthly pattern. So this software really gives you a lot of information about how uh, shade levels are vary, changing over the different areas of a particular plot. And it gives you more information about the frequency distribution of uh, grid cells in the territory in the terrain that are receiving different amounts of shade. So you can really understand where every uh, every point in the territory on the terrain is having the appropriate or less than appropriate or more than appropriate shade levels. So you can plan interventions like pruning or removing trees to regulate the shade in a better way so you can achieve the optimization of the system. Uh, this system, this software is now being connected to information coming from drones and photogrammetry and working on the leader component of the system. And we are using this information to organize pharmaphilia schools activities where you can take any farmer's farm and send the drones, get the information and use the software to, to test uh, how shading is taking place in this territory and develop these handmade mockups so your farmers can really play with moving different trees and different places and different sizes and different management. And once you have this management line, you can really model what is gonna happen and then make decision regarding the optimality or not of the particular software. So this is all what I have to say. Thank you very much. Are we ready for, to answer any questions? Thank you, Dr. Somarriba. Um, so um, yeah, we have five minutes for question. Um, I don't see any question in the chat. So if um, you can raise your hand or open your microphone, perhaps we can I'll give you one more minute to see if there is any question. Okay. Uh, Daniel, I see you open the mic. I would have one question regarding regarding the data that you need in order to start modeling. Is is a, a picture data which you can take from a satellite picture sufficient, or do you need a drone picture? What what's what's the input, the basic or the, the minimal input that you need in order to to start? We're, work, we're working something? in drones, no, because most of the if you want remote sensing data, you need uh, a very high resolution data, which is very, very, very expensive. So at this time, we were working with drones using drones based photogrammetry and also now with LIDAR information. But in the software can be also developed using basic knowledge farmers and the extension agent have in their hands, like mm -hmm. the size of a crown, the shape of a crown some visual estimation or estimation of crown density using, uh, let's say, um, densitometer, optical densitometers and things like that, so that you can really parameterize your model using very simple information. The more complex information they have, you can also add. But in this particular case, we have developed mostly with drones. Uh, we have tried to do more work with uh, remote sensing data, like Sentinel data and radar data. But we see that the resolution for the for the free data, 10 meter resolution is not enough for, for this. Not enough. Okay. Am I allowed a second question? A very quick one, yeah. Have okay. you checked whether your, your hours of shade correspond to something that you can measure with evapotranspiration measurements? This is something that could be really easily be added to the modeling no? because in, in this case we can for example use some uh, radiation extinction model like the beers law to see you know how it changes through light changes through the canopy given a particular canopy foliage density and also we we could really put more sensor microclimatic sensors in the in the in the land to do it we're actually working with IBM to develop a module for the Watson for Agriculture intelli uh, artificial intelligence platform to be able to model this particular issue you know, using more remote sensing data together with uh, drone data and meteorological measurements to 
give more information on humidity and radiation patterns, and also how that influences, uh, for example, population of diseases, based on diseases. So it's moving. On. Thank you very much for the answer. You're welcome. Well, thank you. If there is any further question, please do not hesitate to write it in the chat. We will follow up on that. Um, so now I am also have the pleasure to introduce you, um, Dr. Rolando Cerda, who is the coordinator of the uh, Agroforestry Research Unit at CATI, and he will be presenting today the contribution of CATI's um, breeding program to the productivity of coffee and cocoa agroforestry systems in Latin America. So thank you. Please go ahead, Rolando. Okay. Thank you, Gracia. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. In this presentation, I will uh, show briefly um, the particularities of our collections of cacao and coffee in Katia and the uh, breeding processes that we do here. And then I will show the characteristics of coffee hybrids and cacao clones, mainly, mainly on the production characteristics in different conditions, of course, in agroforestry systems as well. And then um, I will talk about where are these materials and the perspectives. Okay, first uh, I want to talk on, on the importance of breeding and agroforestry for these two crops, no? uh, which are very relevant for millions of families in, in the world. No? Uh, the pests and diseases are always a, a problem in coffee, we have the famous coffee leaf rust, and in cacao, for instance, the frosty rot, which um, causes a lot of losses for, for farmers. No? But we also are facing the projections of climate change, from which we know that many places will uh, lose the suitability to grow these crops. No? So through breeding, we can develop new materials which can reduce the incidences of pests and diseases and, and losses. Uh, of course, in, increase productivity and also the quality of the products. Um, and that way we can contribute to the resilience to climate change of farmers. No? Through these materials, we can also reduce cost of productions. And especially in the case of coffee, we can increase the diversity. No? And agroforestry is very important also, not only for, for, for the crops, because the shade that we have with different kinds of trees can protect the crop and increase the, the productivity life of the plants and also provide important ecosystem services such as diversified production because we can obtain coffee, cacao, but also timber, fruits, etc. We can increase the carbon sequestration and water regulation, soil quality and regulation of pests and diseases if the shade is well managed. No? So through agroforestry, we can also contribute to the adaptation and mitigation to climate change. Uh, for breeding, uh, we have this base in, in Cate, no, which is a, a, a treasure. No? We have two collections in vivo, uh, one for coffee here and, and one and, and two collections of cacao. No? In our collection of coffee, we have near 2,000 accessions and 35% are, are wild materials, uh, which are very important source of, of, of characteristics of importance. This collection is the most important in the Latin American and Caribbean region for its diversity of Arabica coffee and because it's of public domain, no? which means that we can share materials with other users, so students, researchers, farmers, etc., which is not common in other uh, collections. This coffee collection is considered also an origin collection is, and is unique outside of the African continent. No? Uh, in cacao, uh, we have uh, like uh, 1,200 accessions, 10% wild. This is the second most important collection in the world, also in public domain. And we had the duplication of this uh, materials here to Rialba and also in another part of the Caribbean side of, of of Costa Rica. No? So all the materials that we have here are the base for the for the breeding that, that we do. No? Here are two simple uh, schemes uh, for coffee and cacao, which I will show briefly. In, in coffee, we start doing crosses of materials of, of interest, no? and, and that way we produce 
uh, uh, families of, of hybrids, no? for instance, uh, uh, hundred hybrids, we start to do, of course, evaluation of yields, resistant to pests and diseases, uh, quality, etc. Uh, then we select the, the best plants, no? or the best hybrids, hybrids F1, and we multiply this by clonal, uh, by clonal forms, no? by clonal techniques, no? in, in order to uh, at, least, uh, at the end have the hybrids, which we can consider new varieties or new materials. No? This process in coffee can take uh, more or less 13 years to obtain this uh, hybrids F1 no? under this scheme, because if we do traditional methods, we can last 40 or 50 years doing breeding in coffee. In cacao is, is similar, we do, the, we do crosses, we have first uh, hybrids uh, during the five to seven years, then we select the, the best plants and we establish clonal trials to continue with evaluations another five to seven years. And then we put this in clonal gardens where farmers can obtain materials. No? So it's like uh, 15 years at least that we take in, in this crop. So as you can see in both crops, it's a considerable time that we, we take to do breeding, but it worked because we, we can obtain very good uh, results. No? Uh, at the moment, these are the, the most important uh, materials that we are promoting in, in the Latin American region. Uh, for coffee, five, five uh, hybrids, one Central American, you know, Esperanza, Axiopea, and Excelencia, developed by Katia, Sirad, and, and Prome Cafe. No? And in cacao, we are distributing six clones. No? And the most new clones are Katia R1, R4, and R6. R no? All these materials, hybrids, and, and, and clones uh, have uh, characteristics of uh, high productivity. Uh, most of them are tolerant or resistant to, to pests and diseases, and all of them have good or excellent characteristics of quality for coffee and for chocolate. No? You can check in, in catalogs of the World Coffee Research of, or catalogs of CATIE uh, in more detail the characteristics of, of these uh, materials. I will show uh, mainly the characteristics of productivity of coffee and cacao, first with the coffee hybrids, <clears throat> Here we have the Centroamericano, Milenio, Esperanza, Excelencia, Cassiopeia, and I will highlight on, highlight on yields. No? It's important to see here and to take into account that in the region, the average yields are around 15 to 25 quintals per hectare of green coffee. No? So in general, are low yields, and you can see the, the potential of these hybrids no? from, from 60 uh, five to 80 quintals per, per hectare in green coffee. So with these materials, we can at least triple the, the, the production with traditional varieties in the region. And most of these uh, hybrids are tolerant to coffee leaf rust. No? Excelencia and Cassiopeia have some degree of susceptibility, but are considered good materials and distributed because they have an excellent uh, uh, quality. No? So that, that uh, somehow is of interest, of course, for industries and, and, and farmers. This result comes from plots of evaluation of the Institute of Coffee of Costa Rica and Encati. You know? uh, other colleagues also evaluated these hybrids in conditions of, of, of farmers you know, in, in Costa Rica, in Honduras, and El Salvador. They evaluated 20, uh, 21 hybrids, uh, among them the five hybrids that I mentioned. And they also evaluated the traditional varieties to do comparisons, no? for instance, Katura, Katuai, and others. And under the most common shades in, the, in these regions in Central America, under Inga Edulis and Eritrina. No? Uh, and in the results uh, from, from several years, here we can, we can see the yield in green coffee in grams per, per plant per year. No? The red bar represents the hybrids and the white bar represents the, the traditional uh, varieties. No? So they were evaluated in agroforestry systems and in full sun systems. No? In agroforestry systems, we can see hybrids produced more than the traditional ones and all and the same in full sun systems. No? But it, it's important to mention this good result. No? The hybrids produce from 30 to 50% more 
than traditional varieties in agroforestry systems. So this is good information that support us to, to promote these materials uh, with farmers uh, using shade. Um, in other conditions that we have in, in Katia, in a coffee agroforestry SI with many years of, of, of results, uh, where we test um, effects on different variables uh, with the combination of different types of shade and organic and conventional management. No? Uh, there you can see for instance, in, in conditions of moderate shade with conventional management, the hybrid Centro Americano produce more than the double than the traditional Catura variety. No? And also in moderate shade and in organic manage, management, uh, the, the hybrid produce also more, no? not, not uh, as higher as conventional management, but with organic management, uh, a yield of 46 quintals per hectare is, is very good. Uh, then we have here uh, on cacao, no? the characteristics of the cacao clones. Um, first productivity, and this is in the experimental, experimental conditions in our farms. No? Uh, take into account that the average yield, yield in, in the Latin American region is around 300 uh, kilograms per hectare of dried cacao in general in, in, in all countries. No? So it's a very low uh, yield, unfortunately. Uh, and here you can see the potential of these, these clones. No? They can surpass at least uh, two tons per hectare per year in, in our experimental conditions. So, so, so the potential is, is, is great. No? And uh, in, in regarding the resistance to moniliasis, which is the most devastating disease in the region, here you can see that the incidences of this disease with the CATI clones uh, are between four and, and 15% only without the application of chemicals or, or biopesticides. It's only with uh, manual techniques. No? While with international clones, you can see the, the incidence can be very, very high and produce uh, high losses. This is in, in experimental conditions, but we also uh, did evaluations in, in, in the farms of of producers in at least in 30 uh, farms distributed in, in all regions of, of Costa Rica in this in this case. No? So uh, here we have some results. No? We classified the cacao plantations in four groups according to their uh, yields no? uh, that we registered at that moment, two years ago. These are young plantations, about 10 year old plantations. No? So they need more time to express more, more potential of production. No? But the results are very promising. No? And, and what is the difference uh, on these yields? No? Because we have a group with 300 kilograms, similar to the traditional yields, and other group with, with uh, 1,700 kilograms per hectare per year. No? And we found and we documented that the most important factors are fertilizers and the pruning of cacao trees. No? If you do, do not fertilize your plantations and only do one, one pruning, it's, it's a very basic management. Your, your, your yield will be low. But if you increase the prunings, one, three prunings per, per year, one pruning of maintenance and two milled prunings, only with this, you can increase the, the yield significantly, no? 800 kilograms uh, per year. And if you start to do fertilization in combination with these prunings, for instance, here with 200 uh, grams per tree, which is accessible for farmers, then you will surpass in, uh, yields and you can have per year. No? In this, in this investigation, we found that at the moment with a shade cover of, the, of 40%, like 200 trees per hectare and basal area of six to eight square meters per hectare, uh, there were not significant influences of the shade on the production of these clones. No? So this, these are our first data with young cacao plantations and in the future we can confirm and do more research. So in, 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 in summary, this is what we do with, this, with these materials. No? Uh, we identify the problems or the challenges that we have in the, in the region with the crops. We start doing breeding with coffee and cacao, crossing varieties and obtaining new hybrids of coffee or, or cacao clones. 
uh, then we promote these materials in agroforestry systems always no, to, to try to contribute to adaptation and, and, and mitigation. And we teach farmers and students and technicians how to grow these crops under these systems through different kinds of, of events and with farmers, with farmer field schools. And that is the, let's say the route that we have to, to regulate pests and diseases uh, and increase more ecosystem services. And finally, here's some, some that data on where we have these, these materials and perspectives. For coffee hybrids, at the moment, we distributed more than 20 million plants, uh, which is for like about uh, 5,000 hectares of hybrids that are already in hands of producers in, in the region. You know? And we are also send these materials to other countries, and as you can see here, to do more research. And for the future, we, we have at the moment 96 new hybrids in, in, in evaluation. You no. Know? So we expect that, that in the coming years, we are going to release a new promising hybrids F1 for the, for the producers. No? And we also have essays of wild, wild coffee accessions which, with promising quality characteristics, especially, which would be useful to propagate for farmers directly or to use these wild materials in new crosses to generate new hybrids. In the, especially in the Latin American region, we have more than 50 clonal gardens in, in nine countries, which is a very important source of materials for farmers, no? because they can obtain from there vegetative parts of, of the tree and then graft uh, for new trees. We estimate that more than 7,000 farmers uh, already have these six clones of Katia and their farms, and they, they are starting to produce more. And same, similar to coffee, we are continuing with more materials of, of cacao. In this case, we have at least eight new promising clones that we expect to release in the, in the coming years. And we are also establishing new cacao trials in agroforestry systems to obtain more information on agronomic and agroforestry practices to offer to, to farmers, technicians, and, and researchers. And that was my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rolando. Um, so we will have some minutes for questions, so, uh, a couple of minutes. Um, so we have a, a, a question in the chat by Jacob and he's asking, are you using only conventional breeding practices or do you also apply Crave's gene editing to improve the varieties? If not, are you planning to do so? Thanks. Yes, at, at the moment we are we are using this uh, these traditional methods, but um, we are starting to to have conversation with other partners of, of Katia to apply these new techniques, you no, know, with, with molecular techniques, uh, which we think are going to reduce the time to obtain the the coffee hybrids or the cacao clones because we can save time and from the crosses from the nursery start to identify characteristics of interest and only reproduce the most promising material so it can reduce several years at least to, to obtain new, uh, these new materials thank you Rolando. and uh, we have another question if it's possible to get to buy the hybrids from um, katia for new plantations community-based plantations Yes, uh, here in Katia, uh, we have a, an, an area, a commercial area, which is producing, producing these coffee plants uh, in a massive way here in Katia. And we have also partners uh, that can produce uh, plants uh, for, for users. You know? So you, you can request the, the plants and, and, and yes, we, we can provide this in maybe four to six months. Thank you very much. Um, is there any other question? I don't see any uh, raise hand. Um, so Tariku, maybe you can expand a little bit on the question. <laughs> Why coffee hy hybrids? Or you can also open your microphone. We, has, we have a couple of minutes. So I'm saying that 
the, the, the hybrid coffee, they are dark climate change. Why, why they are distributing huge amount of uh, hybrid coffee for the farmers? Yes, because uh, with, with these techniques that we are we are using, we cross not uh, one variety, traditional variety. Usually, with for instance, with with a wild material, and we have, we obtain this hybrid F one. No, so this hybrid F one uh, has very good characteristics of productivity, quality, and resistant to pests and diseases, and and. and and now in the new trials, we are also including variables or indicators that these hybrids can adapt well to, to changes of, of climate. No? Uh, but the reason of hybrids uh, F1 is that um, at that moment, we obtain this material and we need to preserve these characteristics. No? So once that we obtain the hybrid F1, then we need to propagate by clonal, uh, by clonal techniques. No? If you start to do, uh, new crosses, then you can lose the characteristics of the, the hybrid. Okay, so thank you very much. I will uh, then close the questions and answers for now for this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cerda. And now we will move on to uh, our next presenter, uh, who is Dr. Arlen Lopez Samson. Um, she's an uh, agroforestry specialist. Uh, from the agroforestry unit as well, as well. And she will be sharing with us today um, a presentation related with linking cocoa cultivation to, to tree cover, change in Nicaragua and Peru, discourses from local actors. So the floor is yours, Arlen. Thank you, Roland, again. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gracia. Uh, do I have to, to put my, my, my presentation or you have to do it? Can I share my presentation from my computer or I can hear you? Uh, yeah, you can do that. It's, it's better if you can share your screen. Otherwise I, can, I have it. Okay. okay. So thank you, Gracia, for the invitation and for this opportunity to be presenting our work is um, an exciting work that, that we did um, last year with a, with a larger group of colleagues from different institutions. And this is a great, great opportunity to share our uh, main, main results. As you might have heard, there is a lot of debate surrounding cocoa cultivation and it is labeled um, as a driver of both deforestation and reforestation. However, there is a lot of, of um, of um, things or circumstances that we need to look at be behind the cocoa cultivation or the narrative or, of the land history that, that is facing this cocoa cultivation because um, there is, uh, the, there is, this phenomenon varies widely at, at, at both farm and landscape level. So in this, in this um, research, we try to look at those, at those um, resources or circumstances that are behind this uh, this phenomena. So because we know that the cocoa sector is also sensitive to outer shocks and solid events along the supply chain. So we asked three main questions to answer. And the first one was, what is the enabling and limiting condition driving tree cover change in two Latin American countries? Uh, we also asked to, to the expert, what is the opinion about these issues surrounding cocoa cultivation? And also we look at the, I look at the media and the decision makers so um, this three, this three uh, methodology or technique help us to, to understand which are the reasons behind this uh, debate surrounding cocoa cultivation. So we use a five-step a five methodology. Uh, first, we, we look at the statistics, national statistics, and also local statistics. So this gives us um, a lookout of the of the relative role of cocoa cultivation at national level and also local level. Second, we use uh, satellite images to track land use changes in one side per country. We chose Waslala in Nicaragua and the district of Irasola in Peru. The reason behind this decision is because those sites were uh, a front for cocoa cultivation in the past. 
And third, we devise this cultivation or the history behind this cocoa cultivation to understand what are the circumstances, the context, and everything or the forces related to cocoa cultivation. And this gives us the narrative behind this. And also we apply at, uh, the Q analysis to explore the discourses of this expert. So um, this, is, this gives us also another point of view of the discourses surrounding this issue. And lastly, as, as I mentioned before, we, we build a media outlook to see how the, how the media is treating this issue, right? Because it's, it's, it's a controversy surrounding cocoa cultivation and, and other commodities, as Dr. Ibrahim mentioned in, in his presentation. Uh, so uh, we, we, we found that according to the expert that in Peru, nearly 70% of the cocoa cultivated area is under a shade type of um, typology. So uh, this, is a, this is a good thing. 24% of the, of the cocoa cultivated area is under mixed shaded typology. So this, this is a good indication of how cocoa is being uh, planted or established or promoted by different actors. We also found that in Nicaragua, cocoa cultivation, according to the, to the expert, is almost entirely linked to reforestation. Um, we also found that the, uh, using the, the, uh, the timeline that, that the cocoa farming follow a cycle of the war peace process. And this, this process came with uh, another incentive like land titling and support from, uh, from international NGO that promote the establishment of cocoa during the, night, uh, during the 80s and 90s. Uh, we also found that the cocoa might replace the very pasture all and productive coffee plots and all follow. So we can see that the cocoa can maintain or enhance tree recovery in these agricultural areas. But of course, we need to always put this information in another context to see if it is correct. Uh, also, we found that the replacement of cocoa might be triggered by incident of diseases, like what the case of Moniliasi during the 90s. And also there was another factor uh, that is the poor selection of planting material, and this is linked with the, uh, with the NGOs that are working on those areas. We also found that the low coverage of technical services delivered to farmers and fluctuating prices are also um, circumstances that are uh, putting some, uh, some, um, some circumstances that uh, stop farmers to plant or manage more trees. We also found that the cocoa only might replace forests just in, in remote areas where the environmental regulation is weak or absent. Uh, when we did the, uh, the Q analysis, we, we found that the, uh, that the main circumstances or condition linked to deforestation in Guaslala and Nicaragua were the aging of farmers, low cocoa prices, low profitability, and low technical knowledge. We also found that in another group mentioned that the condition behind this deforestation process were incomes from cocoa, low cocoa prices, and private farmers' political incidents. And the conditions that are surrounding deforestation processes were high quality planting material, the relative economic incomes that the family have, and access to safe markets. And also we found that the payment for environmental services, the land tenure and minimum area under cocoa is also other since comparison or factor that are uh, promoting this reforestation in these agricultural areas. When we did the land use trajectory in Nicaragua, this, uh, the case for Waslala, we found that the major drivers of tree cover decline were uh, livestock, small-scale agriculture and timber harvest. So there, there is no evidence that the cocoa is uh, producing any deforestation and disagree with the view from the experts. Uh, we, we, we found that the, from 2000 to 2015, only 120 hectares of cocoa were established, but this is because um, uh, there were other circumstances that were moving cocoa to other areas. Uh, and we found that the, yes, the, there was an increase of pasture land and a decrease of forest-like um, land uses. 
And in this case, cocoa cultivation is the, the, uh, the support that, that, the land, that the cocoa can have in the landscape is really, really small because it's only 1% of the territory. And at the media, uh, there was an agreement with the, uh, with the ex-reviews because we found that the cacao cultivation is labeled as, as agent of reforestation or is used for landscape restoration for NGOs and other projects that are working in Nicaragua, uh, not only in Guaslala, but also in other cocoa farms. And we found that the, um, according to the reports that we just reviewed, that the shade cocoa plantation are like the main uh, models to produce cocoa in Nicaragua. But however, again, the, the, the relative weight of the cocoa in the agricultural sector is really small to say that, that, that they can change or trigger major changes in tree cover. In Peru, we found that the, uh, here we have mixed, mixed views. We linked cocoa cultivation to both deforestation and reforestation events, and the circumstances behind this cocoa cultivation uh, for Irasola studied in the 1980s and, and follow a cycle of migration, forest conversion, and degradation. And this uh, is an opportunity to, to establish tree based crops. We found that the cocoa might replace forested area, mainly secondary forest to gain the land rights and also cash from the sale of timber. We also found that the cocoa might be used to grow annual crops or another fruit trees that are easy to, easy to sell to gain some um, incomes. We also found that in this, in, 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 some, in some part of the country and independent of the times they, that we evaluate, we, we, we found that cocoa cultivation could be abandoned or replaced by faster or more profitable or more profitable crops, such as the oil palm and uh, coca or coffee. And also coca could be abandoned due to social issues and drug activity, which forced families to leave the land. And we also, uh, when, when we look at the, at the condition behind cocoa cultivation in Peru, we found that the, uh, that the experts said that the main circumstances of forces behind these de uh, deforestation processes were the aging of cocoa plants, certification, price fluctuation, and national, and national strategy plans in place. We also found that the cocoa price, the political power of investor, land value, and weak legal framework were also mentioned as, as circumstances behind these um, deforestation processes. Uh, in, on the other hand, cocoa reforestation was linked to payment for environmental services, certification, and shared cocoa typologies. This is, um, this is the model that may, many NGOs and other projects are like promoting in these areas. And also we found that cocoa profitability, growth development and degree of political leverage by farmer is also other conditions linked to uh, this positive tree cover change or reforestation processes. Uh, when we look at the, at, the, at the land use trajectory, we found that the major drivers of tree cover decline in the Irasola district were the expansion of oil pine, a small scale agriculture and pastures. So this is like uh, the, the, the coincidence between, two, be, between the two countries is the pasture and the small scale agriculture behind these deforestation processes. Between 2002 and 2015, we see um, a reduction of forests. Um, the cocoa was increased um, by 28%, but it's really the, the we, we cannot say that the cocoa is replacing forests because they, they, they are other land uses that were increasing in more area. So cocoa mainly here is occupying um, unproductive or degraded pasture. And we found that the, between 2002 and 2015, more than 100, uh, 1,000 hectares of cocoa were established and the crop now covered nearly 2% of the district in the agricultural landscape. And um, we, we have seen that the, the oil palm is the crop that is really increasing a lot in this period of time. According to the, uh, to the media outlook, we, uh, we, 
found as in, as in the view from the expert that, is a, that there is a mix mixed um, results. We have cocoa cultivation labeled as both agent of reforestation and deforestation. But here we found that there, there was um, a change or a shift in, in, in the circumstances behind cocoa cultivation because before 2010, there, there were negative views for cocoa and they, they were like replacing forest. As, as was mentioned in the in the in the areas, but then from 2010 onwards, we have seen a change in this in this view, and now cocoa is seen as a, as a more positive in the landscape matrix because of the NGOs and other projects, big projects, and the government that are working in this area and promoting productive or mixed shaded plantations. So this is this is a key factor to say that the, the, that the private invest, in, investor and other uh, actors can have a big role in changing these trends. Okay, um, so just giving you some remarks. There is someone trying to enter. Uh, so we found that the, this combination of techniques, because as, as, um, as I mentioned, we, we, we combine five types of data. So this, this methodology was useful to, to try to map or give us this idea of the narrative or the land use history. And it's just given us all the conditions that are driving some um, issues that are really hard to identify just doing one one way so this is a this is a helpful approach to, to identify these these um, complex issues we have seen that the cocoa potential to enhance recovery relies on the extent of occurrence and the special distribution pattern across any agricultural landscape as we have seen with the uh, with the with the maps with the land use map trajectory that cocoa is not only a it's not the only crops that is growing in this landscape. So we need to, to tackle the other crops that are growing in this area. And depending on the context and the occurrence of southern events along the value chain, we, we see based on the, on the media outlook that, that the cocoa cultivation can switch from the study of deforestation agent to one of reforestation within decades. But we need to look at those forces behind these changes of shifting in this uh, positive, on this view, this positive view related to cocoa. And we found that this, the, the deforestation and cocoa cultivation cycles need to be carefully analyzed because of this history of land use where it's grown because uh, the timeline and the context that we were reviewing through reports and other documents is, is, is shown that, that it's just different and it's context context specific. So we need to look at this uh, carefully and also consider the landscape unit because we, we, we have other crops um, intervening in the landscape to have these changes in tree cover as a whole. So thank you. Thank you very much, Arlen. Um, so I'm checking some of the questions. Uh, well, thank you for sharing. Um, so I don't see any question in the chat right now. I will perhaps give a couple of minutes if someone who has a, a question. So please free just to open your mic, your microphone to go ahead and do the question. Um, so here's a question regarding uh, Cocoa, but I'm not sure if um, Arlen, you can answer. I think it's related with um, the presentation before, but it's regarding cocoa, uh, which cocoa production system is more productive? Is coffee more profitable than cocoa? So I don't know if you captured some of that in the, or if Eduardo perhaps um, can. Yeah, okay. And according with, with our study, we found that the, it depends of the, of the context and, um, the relative role of the income in the income 
for the family because in in, in Nicaragua we, we found that the that the income from from cocoa are really low so uh, in but in Peru we, we will have this um, this cocoa production that are really more profitable than in Nicaragua because they they manage more efficiently the the shade component and also the the management of the of the crops so it depends which uh, shade topology you are using and for peru we have seen that the uh, the typology using only ingas or the or the productive shade or the mixed shade where um we're producing like similar incomes but it depends where the marker and the history behind this cocoa cultivation or where you position because uh, it, it varies. Um, for Waslala in Nicaragua, the, 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 the profitability from the cocoa production is really low in comparison to the, to the other crops that they have. And so farmers can supply another income from outside the farms or selling the timber trees or the fruit trees that are part of the cocoa agroforestry system because they have this mixed shade cocoa system. Okay, thank you. And the, go ahead, go ahead. And the, and the coffee part is just a, a different crops. So the, yeah, probably Rolando can say about the, the, the differences between cocoa and coffee, which is more profitable at uh, the landscape level if they are like put together. Okay. Um, perhaps Eduardo or Rolando would like to add some to the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I, may, I may want to say something. Productivity. It's more productive or more profitable. It depends very much on what you take into, con into consideration in the calculation. No? You look only at the cocoa or the coffee component, or are you looking at the entire production of the system, including all the products for self-consumption and also for sale? Uh, several studies show that when you take into consideration everything that comes from the cocoa plantation or the coffee plantation, all the agroforestry products, not only the crop, uh, the profitability is usually higher or equal to uh, open sun intensive cultivation of the crop. Is cocoa more or less uh, competitive and financially than coffee? Or well, it depends very much on the context and the management. We see the small farmer, cocoa farmers, that don't intensify their production system and have very low yield. They say less than a ton per hectare. But if you go to other places where cocoa is managed intensively, like in Ecuador, for example, where you work with clones and higher density and a more intense management, the productivity goes to 2,500 kilos per hectare. So the profitability changes dramatically. Same example you can see in coffee. You, know, you have a lot of small producers with very low intensity management in the coffee plantation. They're really marginal in terms of productivity. So it depends very much on whether you're taking into consideration only the revenues from the crop itself, or you're going to take into consideration all the benefits that come from the cocoa plot or the coffee plot, and also the level of intensification that is used by the farmer. So it depends. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, can I say something very yeah, briefly? Please. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, to, to complement Erlen and Eduardo's comments, uh, I, I would say if, if you want to increase productivity in both, in both crops, no? coffee and cacao, given that, that the challenges that we are facing, uh, I think you, farmers need to move um, from traditional plantations to at least a combination of traditional and modern ways to cultivate these crops. No? And the modern ways uh, include from the use of, of better materials like hybrids or co of coffee and cacao clones uh, is essential to do fertilization, which most farmers, uh, in, mainly in cacao, they don't do fertilization. No? So it's an important practice to implement whether you use conventional or organic or organic fertilization, but you need to fertilize these systems. No? And the other part is to to grow and to manage a well-ordered uh, shade canopy, no? a uniform uh, shade cover in all the percent uh, shade cover. No? Thank you. Thank you, Rolando. So mm -hmm. if 
please, if there's any other question, just uh, feel free to write it down or send us an email later. We will uh, be happy to follow up on your questions. Now we move on to our next uh, presentation, which is given by Dr. Laura Venegas, who is the leader of the Watershed uh, Water Security and Soil Research Unit from CATI. She will be sharing with us um, her work on the role of trees in soil water dynamics in tropical agriculture. Thank you very much, Laura, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Gracia, for the invitation also and the opportunity to share some of our research lines in the watershed, water security and soil unit in CATI. I will talk uh, about the role of trees in soil water dynamics Laura, uh, so, yes, yeah, thanks. I guess there is not in the yeah, presentation mode. So the presentation is about the role of trees in soil water dynamics in tropical agriculture. This is a collaborative work from Katy and also uh, colleagues from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. So as an introduction, uh, just a brief mention in that the tropical countries uh, are the ones with the poor development and also projected graded population growth. And in the coming decades, we can expect that uh, there will be an increased food production and together with that, increase in uh, the use of water resources. If, if we think about the agroforestry system as a whole, uh, where we have more or less 10% of trees uh, in the system, uh, we can find that there is around uh, 1 billion or more than 1 billion hectares uh, of the world uh, under this uh, land use. This is data from 2010 and this represents uh, subsistence of uh, more than 900 uh, million people. And if we go through our region, because today we are talking more about, the, well, in this case, I would talk about more uh, Central America, we have that there is 34% uh, of the total agricultural land that is used for pasture, meadows, meadows and pasture. This is data from 2019. And that this area is projected to increase by 32% by, uh, by 2030. Uh, part of the presentation is, is uh, I, I will talk about our, our forestry system and between the, within this, this uh, civil pastoral system, pasture also. So another concept interesting to mention here is uh, the one of trees outside the forest. Uh, just to highlight here that uh, this is important to put in value the trees, the role of trees uh, that we have in agricultural landscape uh, also, not just in the forest itself. And uh, just to centralize here also that there is a need to have uh, or contribute with additional or more knowledge in terms of the role of scattered trees in soil water dynamics, which is the topic that I will address today. And just a little bit about the schematics on the functioning of what, uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, here. We can have in a soil system uh, that we have uh, the root zone, we have an area of the battle zone where there is no uh, complete saturation, and then uh, we can find a groundwater or saturated zone. We can have different sort of a uh, path flow in the, the water entering into the soil. For example, we can find a matrix flow when the water is moving uh, slow into the whole matrix of the soil, but we can also find situations when we can uh, expect or see a preferential flow when the water is entering into the soil and moving faster uh, due to the presence, for example, of more content of macrophores in the soil. When we have, for example, roots decaying and forming uh, conducts uh, big, uh, bigger that uh, allow the water to move faster into the system. So this is more or less to have an idea of what is uh, coming around the dynamic of soil and water regarding the, the trees' presence in the system. There are different methods to study the soil water dynamics. For example, you can uh, think about the double ring steady state infiltrometers, which is the, one of the more common way of measuring infiltration, for example, also rainfall simulators. Uh, but there is also this uh, way of, of uh, methodologies doing this, uh, the use of water stable uh, isotope analyzers would help us elucidate the evaporation and condensation processes into this system. And we found that this is useful for measuring this soil water dynamics. And this is the method that I will mention uh, in this, in this uh, presentation today. So just to remind, uh, in this case, when we talk about the uh, water stable isotopes, we are talking about uh, different uh, atoms, atoms of the, the water molecule. They have different uh, number of neutrons in the nucleus. 
and they have uh, the different, uh, the same number of protons. Here we have the example of the water uh, in terms of the deuterium, uh, which is uh, associated uh, usually with heavy water. And having this difference, differences in masses in these uh, molecules, then we can, uh, we, we will be able to trace and, and get a difference into this uh, unit of measure. And just about what we use specifically from the water stable isotopes, we use the variable that is called LCXs or line condition in excess. And this is a, a measure that we calculate about the difference between uh, what we have measured in the deuterium uh, variable in our water components and the one that is predicted in the system. This is coming from the famous local meteoric water line that is the combination is a regression between the uh, uh, oxygenated and the deuterium. And uh, this came from previous studies that has been measured with a lot of precipitation samples in the area and then what we measure. Then we can see this difference and this is the data that we use for, for our analysis. And we can see, or we have uh, to have this in mind that with more negative LCX values, this will be an indication of enrichment uh, of the isotopes as a result of what we uh, have in the remaining uh, part of the system, which will be the soil in this case. The soil will be more enriched when we see less, uh, sorry, more negative values. So this is uh, just a little bit of theory there, but uh, we will understand better with the research question that we are going to address here. Uh, the first one is that uh, do the trees, the presence of trees influence the magnitude and direction of the relationship between spatial variation of soil water content and this line conditioning excess uh, measure that I mentioned. And the second is, is also an interesting question that remains still not a, a lot of a consensus in the world, uh, so the contribution here is uh, to see if in our region and specific places where, I, where we did these experiments, the trees and grasses use different uh, water sources. If they compete or if there is a niche uh, theory there uh, applying and explaining the, the existence or the coexistence of these two, two species in terms of water uh, resources. So uh, the examples here came from an agroforestry system into Rialba, Costa Rica, where Cat is located. This is a Coffee, coffee agroforestry system with Eritrina Poipigiana trees. And uh, the first data that is interesting to mention here is about the soil water content uh, measured in two seasons. We found that there is a, a difference in the dry season, both at water uh, content in the soil, uh, taken at 15 centimeter depth and also uh, at 100 centimeter depth, this is the panel B. And uh, interestingly that uh, the, the white bars uh, represent coffee, they are the ones that keep more water uh, in, the, in the soil. And in terms of our second example, it comes from a pasture landscape. It is a pasture with scattered trees in Hopan, Honduras. Uh, we also found a difference between the two uh, depths, but in this case, trees uh, gather or, or maintain more uh, water content in both depths. Of course, there is a huge difference in between the pasture, the open area, and the trees uh, compared with a forestry system with the coffee is quite dense and, and act like more or less like a tree, actually. So uh, the other thing that we propose here, this is a conceptual model that tries to explain this relationship between the soil water content and this measure that I mentioned, the line condition in excess coming from the relation between the deuterium and oxygen 18. Uh, and of course, this part that we show the process, the main process is governing the dynamic of the trees in the system uh, regarding with the hydrological cycle mediated by the trees. So we can see that uh, from the isotopic uh, methodology again, we can see that, for example, when we have the main entrance of water in a system, which is precipitation, if precipitation shows a, a signature, isotopic signature, which is similar to the one we found at deeper depth, for example, in the soil, then we can see that there is, we can associate this with a preferential flow, meaning that the water is moving faster because we find the signature that is entering right away uh, in the depth, uh, in the deeper depth. And of course, a process that can be associated with evaporation uh, and getting the soil remaining enriched. Trees also intervene in terms of transpiration, uh, evaporation, and of course, uh, interception to and of course, we can see that there is a, a input coming from through fall and steam flow. All these 
taking into consideration and explain this relationship that we can see also uh, from the panel B in this model. We found that there is a relationship between the soy water content and the LCXs. And if we have a positive relationship, when we have enriched or more negative values on our LCXs uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the content of water in the soil, we can esta uh, establish a relationship a process uh, governing by evaporation processes. And if we have the opposite situation, uh, we will have a more contribution or an explanation of the processes in the system coming from through fall and steam flow that uh, probably we will have more leaf areas expressing more humidity in contrast to what we will have in situations where the leaf are index for example is lower where we will have for example uh, less uh, humidity available uh, less rainfall coming so the situation will change and if we don't find a sort of a relationship quite clear then uh, we assume or we conclude that the, the process governing is uh, transpiration. So how this is applied in our systems? Well, for example, in the agroforestry system in Turrialba, Costa Rica, we found a, a positive relationship, a process governing by the evaporation here uh, within the shade tree or the shade portion of our agroforestry, of our agroforestry system and the coffee. The significant was in the coffee, meaning interestingly that the, there is a process of, uh, sorry, in the trees, an evaporation process. It is interesting to say that because this uh, data came from the dry season. In the dry season in this area in Costa Rica and Turrialba, it's happened that the tree in, in, in our system, which is Eritrina or Pijiana also, there's a process of defoliation. So the leaf are in the, is reduced. And also we have higher temperature, uh, less humidity available. So the evaporation process is uh, highlighted uh, under the shade portion of our system as compared with the coffee, which the, the thing is different. Even if it is not significant, but the, 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 the behavior is different. And in the pasture scattered trees in Copan, Honduras, uh, we have these evaporative processes uh, shown uh, in the open area, meaning that the pasture, pasture open, not tree presence in these areas. And there we have this, this behavior of evaporative processes governing the system. And another interesting part that it is uh, given from this model is a uh, conceptual model is to see that if we, we plot the LCX values measured in the, it is uh, water into the soil measured at 15 centimeters and 100 centimeter depth, we didn't have a, a sort of a difference between the, the two portions of our forestry system in the wet season, but in the dry season, it's interesting to see that the uh, 100 centimeter depth, uh, the LCX values are less negative, meaning that there is a process of a preferential flow happening in this, in this part. And interestingly, during the dry season where the water uh, sources are uh, more or less, in general, we can say that is more limited, but in this area is, is quite a rainy area. But again, the, having these results in rain season, uh, dry season is, is interesting to, to point. In case of uh, Copan Honduras, in our pasture scatter trees uh, system, we didn't find differences between seasons, but uh, all together the system uh, give us also the same behavior, but in this case, uh, mediated by the trees, the process of preferential flow uh, as compared with less negative LCA, uh, LCX test values as compared with the, the open areas. So uh, this is also a process of, of uh, what we can found in the model and uh, explain with this relationship and, and this data coming from isotopic measurement. And the last part that is also quite interesting to, to actually try to check and see if our region is contributing with this debate also is regarding to the water uptake. Where is uh, the tree taking the water from in the soil and where is the water coming from? in case of the pasture or in the open night. So our uh, vegetation type or location are uh, the white bars represent the trees, the uh, light gray is the open grass and the dark gray is the combination uh, pasture be, uh, below the trees. Uh, we can see here the different portions of water uptake. Uh, for example, the uptake coming from the zero to 10 centimeter depth uh, between 90 to 100 and the groundwater pro proportion. 
Um, during the the dry and wet season, of course, these two the, between seasons there is always difference, significant difference. I didn't just put the, the letters here, but the difference are uh, in all cases. But within the 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 systems, uh, there is not of a difference uh, in the portion of the zero to ten centimeters uh, in general. But when we go through the dry season, uh, we have a difference here uh, on the water up, being uptaken from the 90 and 100 centimeter depth. We see that the trees are uh, relying on this portion uh, in a more or less 10% uh, of the sources coming from this uh, portion of, of the, the depth water in the soil, as compared with the open uh, pasture that is relying in a more higher percentage of water using or coming from this uh, portion of 90 to 100 centimeter depth. And again, during the dry season, which is when the resources are more limited. Uh, no differences in the wet season. And at the end, we see that the groundwater is also contributing uh, highly in the dry season for the trees uh, portion of this uh, system and less for the open area. The combination uh, didn't show significant uh, statistical differences. So again, in this, in this, um, with these results, we can say that in this area, in this specific part of this uh, experiment, which is in Copan, Honduras, there is a, a contribution uh, in terms of um, coexistence. There is this uh, Nietzsche uh, theory applying here as a mechanistic explanation of why they are actually uh, working together uh, in terms of water resources, specifically here. So just to, to end up with the main uh, conclusions coming from these two study cases, we can say that the canopy phenology, uh, in this case, we think uh, we have to think about the deciduous shade trees uh, is represented in, in this case for the Erythrina popigiana trees and the coffee shrub uh, in this area. And the rainfall intensities can influence, of course, this local soil water dynamics at a very short distance and in a special heterogeneous system. We saw that during the dry season, there is a process of evaporative soil water losses that are enhanced or were enhanced under the defoliated shade trees. As I mentioned, leaf are index is reduced. Uh, whereas uh, in the case of the canopy, uh, the interception of true fall was greater in the coffee portion of our system. Meaning again, this, the leaf are index in, in coffee compared with the trees in this case was uh, higher. And also that uh, implies a significantly higher moisture. Uh, of, of the soil under the coffee. And there is a slightly uh, lower surface soil moisture under the shade trees uh, that is a result of, of the enhanced transpiration that we can find again. We saw these differences mostly during the dry uh, season. Uh, there is a higher soil surface moisture under the coffee again. Um, and we can see this that can be explained also by the greater preferential flow that we saw under the coffee compared with the, with the trees in low uh, conditions of low rain intensities that we can see. It's not really dry here in Turialbo, but let's say low uh, or less rainfall in this, in this period. And with increasing rainfall intensity, there was less of a difference. Uh, we don't find differences between these two portions of the agroforestry system and the preferential flow uh, will be similar or, or it is uh, given this situation where, where the result is not uh, an issue. There were no differences during the process where we have more rainfall coming into the system. And for the pasture landscape uh, with trees, uh, scattered trees in a pasture, um, again, we saw that there is a positive coexistence uh, between these two parts of the civil pastoral system in this case. Actually not civil pastoral, it's just scattered trees in a pasture, uh, naturally managed, let's say. And there is this partitioning of water resources. And as we saw, uh, during the wet season, when topsoil water is not limiting, both trees and grasses utilize uh, primarily the soil in the surface. But uh, during the dry season, this is these differences that we saw. Trees rely heavily on groundwater and the, the grasses uh, with water coming from 10 to 100 centimeters depth. So this is, as I mentioned before, the night partitioning. Uh, theory, like during the dry season, we can see this as an explanation. They, they uh, exploit the resources uh, when, there is the, when the water in this case is more limited, they divide, they use uh, the preferences from where they are going to bring water to, to transpiration and to, to actually growth. And in this, the, in this case, they do not compete heavily with each other. 
And the trees may have a positive effect on local water dynamics through reduced evaporative uh, soil water losses during the dry season and also enhance a uh, preferential flow under trees. This is what we found in, in, in the pasture. And this is a caption there. Uh, we should be uh, aware and uh, uh, yeah, take these results specifically because different species with higher water demands and relatively greater planting densities, of course, will result in different outcomes. But in general, we can conclude that trees can positively affect the local water balance, which has important implications for landscape management. And we usually uh, are more like, it's more common to find the uh, research uh, about the, the importance of trees in terms of providing ecosystem services like biodiversity, conservation, carbon sequestration. But with this research, with this kind of results, we are also contributing in the terms of taking into account water ecosystem services as an additional a, a source of, of interest, of, of, as an additional a reason to continue promote this a, presence of trees into the agroforestry or pastoral systems in, in our region. So this is more or less what I had to say today. And thanks for, for the attention and open to any, any questions. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, so I'm checking on the chat and we don't have any specific questions. So I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I, I would like to invite you to open your microphone if you have any specific question for Dr. Venegas. Um, I see Hugo Vargas has the uh, microphone open. I don't know, Hugo, Hugo if you have any question um, on this presentation or any other participant in the call. Okay. Sí, sí, buenos días. Este, soy Hugo Vargas, eh, guatemalteco, egresado de Catia. Mucho gusto. Hola, Hugo. <risa> eh, listo. No sé si hay alguna consulta o pregunta en esta línea. Nuevamente reitero la, la apertura y nuestro compromiso de dar seguimiento a eh, alguna consulta que puede generar posteriormente a esta presentación. Entonces, si no hay ninguna consulta específica, te agradezco mucho, Laura, por la presentación y seguimos entonces con el programa, con la presentación del doctor Eliezer Vargas. El doctor Eliezer Vargas tiene más de 15, 20 años, es el especialista en turismo sostenible del CATIE eh, y pertenece a la Unidad de Economía, Ambiente y Agronegocio Sostenible. El... Sorry, I just switched to Spanish. Um, my apologies for those that do not speak Spanish. So the presentation for today will be, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Eduardo, uh, uh, regarding agritourism and expanding agriculture, challenges and opportunities. So my apologies for, for the switch to Spanish. Um, and the floor is yours, uh, uh, Eliezer, please. Thank you. Um... Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here and have this opportunity to share with everyone what we are doing in CATI and the topic of sustainable tourism and specific today, we're gonna to focus on the uh, challenging opportunities of one of the fields, which is the agri-tourism agri or agro-tourism as some other people will refer, basically agricultural based tourism. Uh, for some of you may be a little surprising that um, we have at Gatti a, a unit that work and research sustainable tourism. Uh, should not be surprised since uh, several of my colleagues have emphasized how important is diversification for the um, likelihood of farmers and uh, members of the rural, uh, the citizens of the rural area. So why not? talk about diversification with services. And why not do a service on tourism? So my presentation today is, is structured in three sections. First, I would like to introduce briefly what is sustainable tourism and the uh, vision that we have um, connecting agriculture with tourism at Katia. Then I will take two examples of research. The first one uh, with the idea to introduce um, our a framework or our way of doing research on applied uh, research 
And I will talk a little bit about uh, one of the major challenges that we always have, which is linking farmers to the tourism value chain. And we're gonna do that by um, presenting the case study of Retus and you will figure out what is that very soon. And I will finish uh, with a little bit more of uh, more recent research and aiming in understanding the competitiveness of agritourism industry in Costa Rica. Um, so like I was saying, uh, some of you may be surprised to have uh, tourism in, in Cati, but we need to uh, remember that already in the 70s, uh, Don Gerardo Budowski um, introduced this concept of symbiosis between conservation and tourism. And nowadays, every anyone who talks about uh, ecotourism or uh, nature-based tourism will revisit the legacy of Don Gerardo Budowski. That um, Inside that idea of tourism and conservation has been in Katia for long, and many other colleagues of mine have uh, do um, research and outreach programs, uh, including uh, uh, Miguel Cifuentes, whose uh, methodology for carrying capacity and visitation and natural and natural protected areas is considered by many the world standard, and so that's um why ecotourism and nature-based tourism is now uh, totally out of, of our tradition or research on Katia. Uh, Agritourism, however, has been a little more recent. And of course, as the, uh, as the interest of countries and institutions, communities and uh, business people wants to uh, engage in tourism in the rural area, uh, well, we have been um, looking at what can we do in Cathy for to answer some of those research questions that we may have over there. Uh, so much that uh, most of our research is done now with uh, um, directly on the topic of agritourism or by using certain components of tourism in some of the many thesis that our students and the graduate master programs um, do, including the joint master program in sustainable tourism, uh, a joint program with the University of North Texas. So what we uh, considered normal in Katia as agro-tourism may be a little different to what most people think when they are talking about agri-tourism. Um, most people thinking in a simple equation where you add two components, agriculture, plus tourism. Uh, those who may think that way will find themselves very soon, sooner or later, trapped in the realization that um, we will have trade-offs and we will need to have this um, margin analysis uh, be in the work when we are talking about uh, agro-tourism. What I'm saying is um, it's not as simple as just put agriculture and tourism. Actually, many of the challenges that we have is precisely that simplistic way of understanding agro-tourism. Uh, for us, we understand that integrating tourism and agri uh, agriculture uh, is done in, a, in, in the context of complex adaptive systems and therefore all the uh, we need to all recognize the dynamics uh, the new lunar patterns the multi-agent nature of agrotourism among other important features of um, complex adaptive systems that's why um, we like to say that in Katia we are carrying out uh, transformational transformational research aiming at developing evidence support solutions for sustainable problems faced by the by uh, those in the industry of agrotourism or ecotourism in any section of the of tourism. So that's a really um, fast way to introduce what 
what we uh, do in tourism. And today I want to share with you um, two recent uh, research, action research programs that we have emphasized. And the first one has to do with uh, one of those sustainable challenges that we all face when we are talking about agro-tourism, and which is how do we convince the tourism industry that on a small farmer in a some way remote area or not so easy access a place will have a value for the business of tourism and how we convince them that this is something that they need to consider and that they need to invest on it especially when we review the literature and we then found that uh, the challenges for doing this link between farmers and, and the tourist industry uh, has been recognized for long. And those include issues with the quality of the offering, um, the fitness that that offering has with the general idea of, of the supply chain on, on tourism, or that the farmer might be too far away or outside of what we consider the, the roots, uh, the, the traditional tourism cycles or tourism uh, to a route that the that, that tourism industry has. Or in general, we also know that routinely have been ignored or marginalized, mostly because of the scale and other characteristics of small farmers who wants to get into agro-tourism. Many approaches have been um, tried to over and over to try to solve this uh, need to link um, we and Katia did a start in 2014 with one of those approaches. The concept is very simple. The idea is that a networking among the people who are interested in agro-tourism could help them to be more valuable, more relevant for the tourism industry. And they will be able to bring tourists to their houses and to their farmers, their farms, sorry. Um, so we started uh, with six women who uh, already were working on tourism in certain degrees and, and the idea was that uh, we would connect them and work with them for a long time using um, a lot of action research approach uh, where our students, our researchers will go with the communities and the, with these women, the leader women to um, help them to develop the concept of agrotourism and some way to improve their offering so that the uh, tourism industry will contact them and work with them. Um, those uh, women, uh, a couple of years later, tried on a, on a, on a business model and then tried an association model. And today, after so many uh, good experience and not so many good experience, uh, I think they, they are a very good example of consolidated uh, tour, local tour operator. They actually became a um, local tour operator. Um, um, next, I'm going to show you some of the pictures or part of the website that they have where we can have an idea of, well, this was some of the, the, the women that are now form this RETUS, which is the uh, Red de Emprendedoras del Turismo Sostenible, um, um, Network of Women Entrepreneurs and Sustainable Tourism of Turrialba. And if you go to the website, which is uh, retustour.com, um, you will find the different offerings go from butterfly tours to guayaba tour to um, bread baking to um, diversification, planting, et cetera. And they have grown to a point that now there are 13 members, full members, and 26 providers. And most of those providers are uh, women, uh, rural women, uh, a lot of them in, you know, in charge of the house as a, the main uh, uh, the, the one who brings the, the income to the house. Um, so what we have learned with that action research project that carry almost seven years, eight years in the making, um, 
remember uh, this started as a research project that now they are a business uh, independent totally and but we continue having uh, them very close to us and close to our students well with this experience with this research we have gained valuable insights on how to introduce networking as both a tool and a, a motivational strategy for fostering tourism something that we didn't know how to do. We, we thought it was a good idea. The literature says it was a good idea, but we missed or we didn't know how to do it. Um, we also have game alternatives for better equipped uh, women in rural agriculture areas in Costa Rica to respond to tour operators. Um, one thing is once you connect women in rural areas to tour operators in, in the main cities, this is a whole new social dynamics that uh, need to be learned and we have been able to uh, equip women with uh, a better uh, understanding of that relationship. We also gain knowledge on trade-offs that farmers, uh, specifically the, farm, the farmer's family, are making while engaging in agro-tourism and working with the network. Um, understanding those trade-offs has been essential in order to understand why suddenly one uh, member of the group will not continue participating or why other members will decide to expand their offering. Uh, also, we have gained partner, uh, we have gained partners of cooperation and governance that strongly define the direction of women involved in agro-tourism. Um, a lot has been said about governance and cooperation and we need to also see how women who are involved in agro-tourism will be supported by those patterns of cooperation and governance um, and finally we have game uh, or we have validated uh, participatory methods uh, they intend to support and facilitate the agriculture-based tourism initiatives. A uh, couple of theses and uh, research uh, to the um, graduate research student has been uh, implemented in using this um, action research project. Well, um, also I would like to uh, present another research that has to do with another field and deal with another of the challenges that the agro-tourism faces, and it is the idea of competitiveness. How do you become competitive in uh, in, in industry? And well, uh, this research actually is being carried on as we speak in Costa Rica, and Costa Rica is a, a wonderful place to be located because uh, agro-tourism has become a almost like mainstream, if I may say. There's a lot of offering and it's a perfect place to, to do research in this moment. So what we have done uh, so far has been um, research on typification analysis. Um, we have research motivation and expectation. We are making, uh, creating mapping of the value change and also a lot of research on best practice for identification. All, all this aspect will, will help um, decision making in order to decision makers in order to enhance the competitiveness of agro-tourism initiatives in the region or in the country. Uh, today, I want to mention two of those a specific researchers. One has to do with, uh, obviously, with one of the favorite topics in Katia, which is coffee. So what we did is we did our first ever typification of coffee tours in Costa Rica, where we aim also to analyze uh, the clusters uh, and the characteristics of those clusters. Um, what, um, what we were able to identify was uh, what we consider the first um, ID of uh, coffee tours in Costa Rica. It's a comprehensive list that is available. And we got 22 companies, which will be 
um, formal companies offering tours. Um, there's more companies, oh, sorry, more initiatives, but because of the methodology and the way that we were doing, uh, we were doing this research, we have to define uh, what a formal offering of coffee tour means, and that's why we end up with uh, 42. Of those 42, uh, we were able to um, uh, get uh, useful uh, survey responses and follow up interview with at least 23 of those, sorry, with, um, um, with um, 24 of those uh, coffee tours. These are general uh, description of the people that has been involved in this research, uh, like I say, survey and interview. Um, as some of the characteristics, uh, we were able to talk to nine managers, uh, three employees and 11 owners of those uh, enterprises. Uh, 50 companies had been operating for more than, than between one and 30 years, five companies, 18 to 37, and amazingly, a at least two companies argue that they have been working offering coffee tours more than uh, 55 years. Um, offering tours is one variable that we also were trying to understand completely and meaning uh, what type of activities they were giving because it's not only receiving the people and bringing them and show them the coffee plan but we wanna know if they are incorporating other uh, steps of, of the processing of coffee and if they even um, have souvenirs related to coffee or they have uh, uh, information about the history of coffee, et cetera. So after uh, getting the response and, and classify, we want to share some of the results and some more related for the typification and we were able to um, use the, the warm uh, technique and that will give us the possibility to have three clusters uh, using mostly uh, the differential variables uh, length of time the company has began and since the length of time the company began providing coffee tours the total number of selective offering of coffee tours and the total number of amenities in addition to coffee tours. And finally, the total number of media platforms utilized. So, yes. yes. We only have um, maximum five more minutes. Um, okay, doc. And there okay, are some so, questions already. Thank you. Good, good, good. Um, so those are the three clusters. Um, uh, the general description is uh, we have in Costa Rica three distinctive clusters of coffee tours. One uh, motivated mostly by uh, history and sharing values. And the most uh, recent cluster is more motivating because of the sustainability um, so this is an example of one study that brings um, the idea of uh, understanding better how the, the um, businesses on agro-tourism uh, fit in, in the map of the country. Another example that we recently did and we couldn't finish, this is a, a study that is still carrying on. We are wait, uh, waiting for be uh, able to complete it so that the pandemic allowed us to continue finishing with the, um, with the um, interviews. And the idea here is to look at the, what, what are the, the, the best practice, uh, the key success and barriers to grow that people who are involved already in agro-tourism report. So given the, the lack of missing time, I will go directly to some of the uh, results. Um, remember this is, preliminary and, and is based on uh, 15 complete surveys and interviews done, um, but we are still uh, trying to finish the 41 that is our target. So we have here um, that most of the 
uh, business identify themselves as a sustainable uh, motivated um, which was an interesting surprise for us here um, then of that when we asked what are the major challenges on top management time and expertise is, and this was no surprise for us because this is what literature uh, emphasizes that once you combine agrotourism and uh, agriculture the management expertise is the, the major challenge. And in best practice, we found in Costa Rica, at least 81% are using 14, uh, 14 or 15 of the 18 practices that we identify as a best practice in, uh, um, in agro-tourism. And here, I will stop here. Um, when we ask them what are the three major reasons regarding um, why they want to do this, why they want to be in agro-tourism, uh, reasons were knowledge sharing, education, social cultural change, and sustainability. Um, we were really happy uh, so far with what we got, and I'm looking forward to share with you a little more uh, information in the future. Um, thank you very much. And Let's see if we have some questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Lieta. We are um, running a bit out of time. So there is one question regarding um, from Dr. Dani Lopez. So um, how, has COVID, uh, how has COVID affected agrotourism in Costa Rica more or less than other tourism options? Uh, what have you observed in this line? Thanks. OK. Um, let me say that we were um, shocked um, in February, March of this year in, in the middle of the research because uh, we were trying to reach the companies and some of them were saying, well, we are closed and we are not operating. Uh, and that was surprising because uh, we understand that they were farmers. Okay, and so this is what I realized, or we realized that a lot of people have incorporated agrotourism in some way in addition to agriculture, not integrated to agriculture. So we check a couple of, of those um, businesses and they were operating as, as uh, farmers, but they were just uh, not offering tours, obviously, because there was no tourism to, to offer. But when we interview them, they respond as, as a tour operator, no as a farmer. And so we went back to them and we say, well, we want to also uh, know how have you adapt to uh, Kobe and how is this crisis of the tourism is affecting you. And so we, we were able to get some of the feedback. So yeah, um, to be honest, um, even today, um, I think more than half of those People that we have in the list, we have in the list 41, uh, at least half of those are still no saying that they're offering a uh, coffee tours or agro tourism experience. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other question in the chat. So um, yeah, because of time, I will have to leave it here. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your presentation. And now we will move on. To the last presentation, um, that is um, my presentation. So as you have seen uh, thus far, we, we have uh, shared with you uh, the broader aspect on, on the research lines that Katy has. Uh, we have agroforestry, livestock, we moved to water, and now um, and just recently with um, agrotourism. And I will be sharing with you very quick um, because of time, uh, some, re uh, some research that we are doing regarding behavior economics. So this is a, a field experiment that we did in Costa Rica. Uh, this is a collaborative effort with uh, Francisco Pisa from the Academy University and Research Center, as well as with Freddie Carson from the University of Gothenburg. And uh, basically what we are um, analyzing is the fairness of environmental friendly alternatives. So what is, is the background of this study? Um, we have nowadays more and more often that we are able to find more environmentally friendly goods in the, in the supermarket. Um, you can see that um, some meat substitutes, uh, plugging in hybrid uh, instead of gasoline cars, 
biodegradable, biodegradable bags instead of plastic bags. Now they that um, more uh, environmental awareness is uh, changing or trying to change some consumption patterns. But at the end, looking at what is the offering of these environmentally friendly goods, we are not so certain about the and the environmental impact, considering that there might be um, some rebounds effects. Um, there is already been proven in the literature that we can observe that by introducing this technological development and mainly in the energy sector, then you achieve these higher fuel efficiencies and then that lower the prices and at the end also contributes to increase the income. But then by having this combination of lower prices, higher income, then you end up uh, using more energy or more often the car that you, what you were using it before. So then you have this rebound effect. So there are some um, results. The results vary considerable between the literature as uh, the, there's more research needed to be done. But what we have uh, observed that by introducing this technological development, we do not always achieve um, the positive effect that we are aiming to. So we have two different lines of the rebound effect. We have the economic one, as I mentioned, we uh, reduce the price and then we also have um, more money to, um, to spend in a more environmentally friendly good. So because we, we feel that we are actually um, contributing to uh, reduce the environmental impact, we end up uh, having more money. So we are able to pay um, for these additional um, environmental goods. So this increase in demand for the cleaner good and reduced demand uh, for the dirty goods, how much is really this compensated if we you reduce the consumption of dirty goods, but at the same time, you are, in, you are also consuming a higher amount for this uh, more environmentally friendly good. Um, then, but then you also have not only, as I mentioned, the rebound because if you have more money to spend on higher, or more expensive um, environmentally friendly goods, but you also have this altruism that you want, you care about the environment and you also incentivize um, the, the increasing demand for this good. So at the end, this net environmental effect um, really depends on if you actually contemplate the whole environmental damage of the uh, new uh, environmental good. And it, we are really, um, is the final estimation, it's, it's still, um, could be, a, the final effect could be even a stronger, the compensation, because we are dealing in a, in a imperfect information world. So there is a, a lot of uncertainty that we need to deal with it right now. Um, but basically in this paper, we focus on looking at what is the effect on behavior. So we look in a specific of how the introduction of a more environmentally good, uh, friendly good can actually change behavior. Uh, we talk about the, the main problem, for instance, of uh, uh, pollution in the oceans is the highest amount, the high amount of um, waste that is being disposed. But then uh, when we introduce this type of uh, environmentally friendly goods, we try not to, we are not completely certain that we're changing the behavior. So that this paper is based on that, looking at what if, what if um, we introduce this, do we actually are able to observe a change? Um, so um, we introduced uh, um, a field experiment on in the farmer's market in Costa Rica. Um, as in Latin America, we are aware that the enforcement mechanisms are weak, uh, are weak and therefore, uh, when we're talking about uh, waste pollution, for instance, we know and is there is evidence in, in the literature as well that bans will not completely are not efficient. So it's a mix of, of instruments that can actually help us reduce uh, the pollution. But what will happen in this context, like in the farmers market, where um, single-use plastic is is um, a strategy for marketing, and consumers consumers are just used to have access to this type of uh, of products. So we test three different versions. One, we introduced the bio bag for free, uh, so the consumer actually had the choice uh, between the plastic and the bio bag. Then we introduce. Um, 
a price a price factor. So the bio bag was associated with uh, about 25 colonas. So you have to pay. You still have the option of uh, pursuing just a plastic bag that it was still for free. And then we add um, to a uh, third scenario looking at the bio bag. It's still associated with the price, but looking at the, what is the effect of the default option. So by default, your product was packaged and, and, and we will talk more detail on, on that later, how the experiment was performed. As I mentioned, we work in the farmer's market in Costa Rica. Uh, we were in, in Cartawi, around 12 markets. And here you can see that uh, many of these farmers, basically uh, they use the plastic bags as an strategy for marketing. They pack two kilos of potatoes, for instance, and it's just each to pack. Consumers are just um, used to have this service for free. So they don't have to pay. It's different when you go to the supermarket and then you have to pay for an extra uh, bag. But in this setting, um, it's, it's the, the amount of plastic that is consumed is high and it's, it's very difficult to control from the authority. So how will this consumer behavior change if uh, more environmentally friendly alternatives are introduced? So we introduced a bag, we did a research. This is um, important to mention that in terms of the utility for the consumer, has a, didn't change in terms of the plastic, the bio bag look exactly, it only has a little bit uh, greener color compared to the normal plastic bag, but um, it provides the same utility. It re has resistance. Uh, you can see the product, all these attributes that are basically um, requested by the consumer when using a plastic bag in the, in the farmer's market. It is important to mention that there is still, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a lot of uncertainty about the environmental impact, specifically when you are looking at the chemics, biochemistry of the, of the bio bag, but we are not focusing on that uh, right now. We are using, we did use a bag uh, that was certified uh, to be completely um, biodegradable and is, it's uh, according to the national strategy to reduce single use plastic in Costa Rica. So. Um, but this is also, um, as I mentioned, something that should be considered for further research. Um, so we have three treatments uh, and one control group. And the control group, basically, we monitor and we assured that no um, alternative was introduced in those markets during the, the period of the, of the experiment. The first treatment, as I mentioned, was including uh, providing the bio bag for free, and we had a sign in each of the of the um, vendors' space saying that if you would like to reduce pollution in the oceans by using a biodegradable plastic bag, um, you can you can get it here, and you ha they have basically the option of choosing the bio bag or the plastic bag. So it was um, uh, something that also the vendor was um, suggesting to the to the consumers. We also had the second treatment when basically we have uh, the same message, the same message, but addition with the addition that, yeah, would you like to use it? But you will have to pay 25 colonas. That is about five cents in, in US dollar. And then uh, the last one, as I mentioned, the vendor basically um, it packaged the product in a bio bag. So the price was more salient in treatment two than in treatment three, because in, in treatment three, basically some, some people didn't pay much attention on the price, the total price, but it was included already when they were um, paying the total. Um, the research design, so we focused on two uh, main dependent variables. One was the, the reduction of plastic bags, so we can actually observe whether it, it did reduce um, the consumption of plastic bag, but to observe the rebound effect, we needed to measure the total number of, of bags per vendor per day. So we, we implemented a between subject design in a cluster randomized setting, uh, two weeks before and two weeks after. That means that two weeks before we implemented uh, the experiment. So we were measuring um, the amount of bags that were used from five to 12, uh, 5 a.m. to 12 p.m. because this uh, uh, farmer markets fair only, only happened on Saturdays. Um, so we consider each market as a cluster, and uh, we pick, we randomize the treatment in the in the market, and we also randomize the selection of the vendors that participated in the in the in the experiment. So we have fifteen vendors for each of the of the 
farmers market and we pick it basically from randomly from the list that was provided for the uh, board of each of these farmers market. Uh, and at the end, we have three cluster per treatment. That means three uh, farmers market for each of the treatments. What are, what are our hypotheses is uh, are basically one that in treatment one, because it's given for free. So what we anticipate is that we might find or observe a large reduction in plastic bags, but we might observe an, a larger increase in biodegradable bags because both are given for free. And if the rebound of effects is there, then people will tend to consume more biodegradable, biodegradable bags because they just uh, think that is uh, more environmental friendly. And then treatment two, we also are considering the price effects. So we anticipate a smaller reduction in plastic bags because then people are still having the option to have the plastic bag for free might be not so willing to pay for these 25 cents for the biodegradable bag. So we still might be able to, fi to find an, as a smaller behavioral rebound uh, there. And in treatment three, because we are in, uh, setting the bio bag as a default, um, we are anticipating a reduction in plastic bags and an increase in bio bags. So um, a little bit, larger than in treatment too, because it's a default effect, because we are providing, uh, packaging the products by default there. What, uh, what uh, did we observe? So here, this is purely descriptive. You can see that um, in the baseline, so these are two weeks before the treatment, and these are the two weeks uh, after. So in the control group, um, you can see from the, uh, from the, the gray, light gray bar, bars are the one with the plastic bag. So there are in the, before the treatment, you can see that there are uh, some difference, statistically dif uh, significant between the groups. So we do control for that in our regression. I will show you later on um, because there were some structural difference in the group uh, of the markets. And then um, you can see that as we were expecting uh, in treatment one, there is a considerable reduction in the plastic bags, but uh, the dark bar, the, the dark gray bar here in the treatment two shows the rebound effect. So the total number, so total number of bags would be bio bags plus plastic bags does uh, is significantly different than the other ones. And here you see a little bit uh, the reduction is lesser in the treatment too, just as we were expecting. And this is purely descriptive. We will see what the regression says. And then in treatment three, we observed that the number of plastic bags, uh, the, total, the total bags uh, is higher than in treatment two. Um, so what we did to analyze the data, uh, considering as I mentioned that we have this um, cluster design, we have to control for those differences in, in the market as, as we saw before in the descriptive. So including that regression, um, we run a random effects model with this random intercept. So we control for the market differences and also we control for that individual difference. So here in the regression, you see that our uh, coefficient of interest basically is beta, beta three, where we want to see whether the interaction of the treatment actually has an effect on the consumption um, behavior of the, the people that visit the, the uh, farmer's market. Um, okay, so what the results tell us um, in the plastic bags, uh, as I mentioned here, and this basically confirms the descriptive, we observe the difference, it's about 86 bags less when we introduce um, the bio bags, we observe this um, and this has implications at the policy level because if you reduce this amount of plastic bags, the amount of garbage that has to be managed later on by the municipality, it, it does have a, an impact in terms of gas and transportation required to, to manage the, the, the uh, waste. Um, so we see that in plastic, if you, we look at exclusively the plastic bags by introducing this um, bio bag, consumption of plastic bags was reduced. In treatment two, as expected, the reduction is still significant, but it's slightly uh, lesser than the other one. And in treatment three, 
uh, is even smaller. It's still significant, but it's still um, this the more, um, this this effect is a smaller. Why we think that um, one, you are not making this active choice on uh, reducing the the deciding which bag you consume. Um, it's also something that people will not notice if you decide to choose for a more environmental, environmentally friendly option than compared to other one. And we did observe, and as we will see in the latest uh, slide, there was some reactions to one being forced on something. And this introduction, particular, particularly on a plastic bag associated with a cause was not well taken by especially elder um, people. Uh, with the total number of bags, we do observe a significant difference in treatment one. So this basically confirms our hypothesis that the rebound effect exists if we introduce these environmentally friendly options for free. And in treatment two, there was no significant difference. So that was, that was something um, interesting. While in treatment three, we observed that it's, it's uh, very similar to treatment one. So what we are looking here is that um, the active choice of deciding where to, uh, which bag to decide uh, to buy or, or use has an influence on the, uh, the effect that you might estimate. Also the introduction of any um, more friendly alternative should not be um, incorporated without any price association. So if, in order to, uh, reduce the rebound effect, we need to, um, or policies, governments need to be um, incentivizing innovation, but um, making us still aware that this type of uh, alternative products will not change consumption patterns as such. Ideally, we will stop using plastic bags, but uh, since uh, this change is so abrupt, that cannot be happening uh, instantly in settings like this in the farmer's market, um, this in the introduction of some other alternatives might be an option. Um, so conclusions are basically just very quick to what we, uh, what I just mentioned, the results are consistent with the strong uh, behavioral rebound effect. Um, and this effect is countervailed by a small price effect. Uh, and as I mentioned, they should not be that all these environmental friendly alternatives should not be introduced for free. And um, this default setting on having not the option of designing the self imaging is still uh, something that uh, will be interesting to further uh, analyze as people behave um, according to what they think the others uh, they do, they should do, but and uh, not being able to show that you are being uh, more mentally friendly has uh, has uh, an impact on the amount on the effect of the treatment that you are uh, implementing. Um, and there are some that the, the increase in the total number of bags in treatment three might be associated with this heterogeneous effects at the individual level. So uh, rushing and considering your time, I really appreciate that. I, um, is I'm rushing um, three more minutes. Uh, so um, Danilo, this is the difference between people from the developed and developing world and the perception of what are the dirty goods? That's a very good question because um, we did capture, try to capture what the people understanding regarding this plastic um, it, and taking in this context, we use plastic bags. Um, it's completely, we observed that there are difference in terms of um, what I consume and how my consumption affects uh, the pollution that is not so near nearby. And uh, in the developed world, there is uh, more uh, willingness to pay. There is more awareness. And in the developing world, there is still uncertain, uh, uncertainty, but not so clarity what the dirty goods are. And it's, it's, uh, uh, yeah, the affordability is definitely different between the, the two um, the two settings, developed and developing countries. Um, so I will stop there because we are definitely running uh, uh, over the time that we scheduled for this session. Um, again, if you have any um, question or follow-up question, I'll be happy to um, follow up. We will send you an email and 
um, just to share with you and to let you know where you can find all the presentations that you have uh, seen today. And um, if, yeah, if there is any other question or comment that you would like to do, um, maybe I'll give a minute or so. If not, I will uh, close the workshop here. I really appreciate your time again, and I'm looking forward to collaborate with all of you in the future. So thank you very much and have a nice day, evening, whatever you are. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Enjoy.